Welcome to another Blender Cookie tutorial. My name is Kent Trammell, and in this video we're going to be taking another look at realistic skin shading with Blender. So far we've walked through this subject twice already, once in depth with the Blender internal render engine in the uh, Realistic Head series, and then we briefly touched on it uh, with Cycles in the Pancake Hobo course. Uh, but thus far we haven't gone in depth with skin shading in Cycles yet. So that's what I want to do. Now, uh, if you've watched any of my training before, hopefully you know right away that the first order of business is taking time to observe reality. And for human skin, this is especially necessary because uh, everyone sees human skin every day and subconsciously knows precisely how it's supposed to look. That's why it's so hard for CG artists to get right because if it's the slightest bit off, we all can tell and the illusion is broken. However, understanding why human skin looks the way it does is another story, knowledge that isn't so common. So please study as many reference photographs as you can if you want to create a believable skin material. Uh, but since I have gone over skin observations before in the Pancake Hobo course, I'm only going to hit the basics here. But if you want a more detailed explanation, please go see the skin lesson in that course. Uh, okay, so the buzzword when it comes to skin shading is subsurface scattering. And this is basically a fancy term for translucency. Um, if we take a look at this reference photograph, um, it's a very typical studio lighting setup with very harsh back and rim lights, which are pushing a lot of light through the ear here. And this is typically when it comes to subsurface scattering and human skin, most people look straight at the ears because that's where the effect is most noticeable and you can get a very bright orangish red glow. And this color is what bleeds through the shadows and softens the shadows. Notice here at the nose, if we zoom way in and then if I just right click and hover over um, the edge of our shadow, notice just how red the color is. That's actually happening on all the shadows across the skin. And this is the key thing that I want you to take away from this observation and that we will need to recreate. As we pull back out, in general, um, the effects of subsurface causes a, a softening of the shadows and therefore a softening of the skin detail. And uh, as far as the orangish red color, that's coming from uh, different layers underneath the surface of the skin, like blood, like muscle, and fatty tissue that combine to give us that color as the light scatters through it. And with all that in mind, let's jump into Blender and take a look at the assets we have to start with. Uh, so this comes from a personal project that I did a couple years ago. Um, it's a slightly stylized um, elderly man head. And the reason I want to use this is number one, there is a ton of detail built into the geometry through a multi-resolution modifier up to level five. If we jump up to that level, you'll see um, all the skin and pore detail that I've included in the actual geometry. Uh, you can see how heavy it is um, considering the viewport sluggishness now. And it's important that this is included in the geometry, meaning that it's breaking the silhouette. It's not only included in a bump map or some kind of cheat, but it's actually affecting the shape of the geometry. This will help to ensure a more believable uh, subsurface scattering effect. So let's bump that back down to, let's say, level two. And uh, along with this very detailed uh, piece of geometry, I also have um, all the texture maps that I painted uh, specifically for human skin, things like uh, epidermal texture map and subdermal texture map, bump maps, subsurface scale maps, specular maps, all the textures that I would need for a realistic skin shader I've already created. It just needs to be plugged into a shader appropriately. So before we actually create the shaders, let's go through the render setups that I have. I'm just going to split my user interface over here to give me a very small uh, render viewport. And I should have a camera, let's hit zero, there we go. Making sure that I'm in the Cycles render engine, I'll go ahead and enable uh, viewport rendering or shift Z in that viewport. And we have a black silhouette because I have no lights visible. So let's jump over to my layer management add-on and enable layer Ren A, which is my first lighting scenario. Pretty standard stuff with um, a strong key light, 
a uh, back slash rim light, and then um, a large card which acts as a sort of global rim light that uh, will show up particularly well um, with reflections. And then uh, let's go to the next one, Rin B. This is uh, actually very similar, except um, I would change the world value. So let me go choose a uh, environment map. I will, of course, um, include some environment maps in the source files. And um, okay, so if I bump this up to, let's say, 0.5, now we have a lot of environment lighting contributing to our shadows, lightening them up a whole lot. And then finally we have render scenario C, uh, which if I, uh, let's see, turn off my environment light again, this setup is useful for looking at how backscattering works through the ears and if um, my subsurface values are good. So yeah, the reason I show you these is um, in order to get the best skin material, um, you'll want to look at the shading through different light setups. And if it looks good in all the lighting situations, then you can have confidence in your material. So I think I'll start with um, scenario A, just because uh, it's a little bit more neutral and standard. And uh, let's get started building materials. I'll switch my uh, 3D viewport to the node editor with the N key. And right now I have one of my cards selected, but if I select my head geometry over here, we have no material associated. So uh, let's create one and I'm gonna call this skin underscore simple because I'm going to walk you through a couple different skin shading setups. Um, obviously I named this one simple. So the first one is going to be a fairly bare bones approach, just using the subsurface scattering node and textures associated with the model. And then after that, I'll show you a more complex approach to subsurface scattering, specifically for skin, uh, with Matt Heimlich's port of the Arnold skin shader, which has all the bells and whistles of three layer skin shading uh, that you may be familiar with if you come from V-Ray, Mental Ray, um, or obviously Arnold. But um, being more complex means that it actually renders about half the speed uh, as the simple setup and you can actually get a very believable result with the simple setup, but um, still, I think it's good to know both ways. So now let's introduce our subsurface scattering node with Shift A, Shader, Subsurface Scattering, and we'll remove our diffuse BSDF and plug in the BSSRDF output into the surface input. And immediately we can see in our viewport um, that way too much light is now penetrating the surface and scattering around. It's glowing way too much. So the first setting I usually tweak is going to be this scale value right here, where the higher the value, the easier it is for light to penetrate and the further through the surface it can penetrate. The lower the value, um, the harder it is for light to pass through the surface and it doesn't go quite as deep. So let's bump this down um, to 0.1 and you'll see that uh, less light is able to make it all the way through the object and our shadows uh, appear. And if we go uh, down a little bit more, let's go to 0.05, cut it in half. Our shadows get even darker and more of our model starts to appear while we still have a lot of light shining through, especially uh, in the ears because they're the thinnest part of our head mesh. But that's still a little bit too high. How about uh, 0.03? I think that's gonna be a good value based on uh, my exploration of this shader. And now with that dialed in, it'll be a lot easier to go over these settings, which I will quickly run through. First, we have um, the fall off algorithm that we can select, uh, where I kind of look at these in reverse order from bottom to top, where compatible is the old algorithm that's about to be phased out and removed from trunk. So we don't need to worry about that at all. Um, and we're going to be left with cubic and Gaussian. Cubic is a, a sharper fall off based on the documentation and uh, it actually renders a little bit faster, but then uh, Gaussian is slightly more complex of an algorithm, so it takes a little bit longer to render, but um, it's perhaps a little bit more physically accurate, though when I compare the two, I really don't see any noticeable difference, aside from a slight render time savings with Cubic. So I'm going to select that. It is the default, or it should be. And below that, we have color, and this is the general color of our object, so if we um, let's see, switch that to, let's see, zoom out here, switch that to green, 
You know, it looks like a green object that scatters, which uh, is probably pretty obvious to you. Of course, that's what that does. But with subsurface scattering, if we jump down, we've already addressed the scale option here. Below that, we have radius. And um, this is where we control what color the scattered light becomes. So if you remember that reference image we just looked at, uh, in the shadowed areas, on the edges, I pointed out how red the shadows were. And this is the scattered color glowing through the shadows. And with skin, it happens to be red. So if we open up those options, we have three values with uh, really no description. But uh, the first one is the red value, the second one is a green value, and the third is the blue value. So RGB, which gives us a, an overall color. So uh, again, with skin, we're looking for a red color. So let's leave the first value at one and then start to decrease the green and blue, which should leave us with more red. So let's uh, bump these down to half, 0.5 and 0.5. And you'll start to see that we get an overall green color of our object, but the light that passes through causes it to glow red. And I think I want it to be a little bit more orange. Let's. Uh, remove the green color, take saturation all the way down to zero. Um, so, okay, yeah, so I don't have any green interfering and it's clearly a very red color. So in the radius, let's uh, bump down my blue value. So now we have a little bit more green in the mix, which should uh, take it closer to orange. What if I bump that up to 0.6? Yeah, we're starting to get um, a little bit closer to orangish yellow, but still mainly uh, red. All right, I think that's good for the radius. That is a very important setting. I would say radius and scale are the most important, but we have a couple more options. Uh, below radius, we have sharpness. Now, uh, what I can tell sharpness does is kind of the same thing as decreasing scale, but uh, just to support my theory on what it does, let's go ahead and do um, a couple renders. Number one, we will render this with uh, sharpness turned off. Then let's uh, switch to, let's go to slot seven and um, go back to the node editor by hitting escape. And uh, let's change our sharpness all the way up to a value of one and uh, render that again. And now if we switch between slot eight and seven, you can see uh, in slot eight that uh, the details, especially in the forehead around the eyes, and well, generally the front of the face, it gets a little bit blurrier, but then um, at seven, they sharpen up a bit, um, but also there seems to be more light passing through the ears. The glow gets a little bit brighter. So um, changing the sharpness setting is not exactly the same as simply dialing down the scale, but um, it's some sort of in-between that tries to sharpen the details of the geometry while still maintaining that scatter amount. And uh, jumping back to the node editor, um, I usually leave sharpness off because uh, I kind of think it detracts from the believability a little bit. But uh, below that we have texture blur and this really only um, is noticeable when we're using a texture because it does exactly what you would expect. It blurs that image. And the idea behind this is if you read the docs, it states how, um, for example, if we used a photograph to create our textures, uh, it's already blurred. There's already blurring happening within the subsurface effect because the picture is of subsurface skin. Whereas if we hand paint a texture, we might not necessarily build that in. And especially if we use a, a procedural, we'll want to blur based on the subsurface scattering algorithm. And that's really where this comes in handy. So I rarely ever touch the texture blur setting. And that is all for the um, features of the subsurface scattering node. Uh, do note that if we switch to Gaussian, we lose the sharpness option, uh, which again lends itself uh, to me believing that sharpness is more of a cheat effect rather than being physically accurate. But um, anyway, other than that, that's uh, all for the subsurface scattering node. And we're ready to plug in our textures. So I'm going to add an input texture coordinate node way over here off to the left, and then add input, uh, I'm sorry, not input, texture, image texture. And first we're going to load um, our general head uh, color texture. Let's enable thumbnails so we can see exactly what we're looking for. And this is what I want, head color right here. And then uh, let's plug in our UV to the vector. 
and the color of our image into the color of our subsurface scattering node. And uh, right away, you know, it looks a little bit more human. Though, um, in general, the whole texture feels a little bit too orange. Um, so let's uh, add a, um, let's see, color RGB curves node in between the image uh, color output and the subsurface scattering node. And for the red channel, I'm going to take the right upper corner and just drag it down a little bit, then jump to the green channel and drag that down about half as much. Yeah, that feels a little bit more natural. Maybe a little less red. There we go, that feels better. And uh, that's really it for having a texture plugged into subsurface scattering color. But uh, we can also use textures for everything else. So I'm gonna show you what a scale texture does. And uh, with shift control D, to duplicate the image texture node while maintaining the connection to the texture coordinate node. And let's go open another texture that I have already created. Um, and I have two different versions of this. It's called SSS Scale and SSS Scale B. Uh, now Scale B was procedurally created by simply inverting the head mesh and then baking an ambient occlusion map that will conveniently give you darkened areas around the thinnest portions of the mesh, like the uh, ears, the eyelids, the nose, and the lips, which is, you know, if you want to control the scale, that's where you're going to want to control it. Um, so that one's pretty cool, but uh, this first one is what I'll use, and it's just simply hand-painted around the um, ears and the eyes. So let's go with that one. Both of them will be included in the source files for you to play with. But um, Okay, so now if we plug this directly into the scale value, there will be absolutely no subsurface taking place in the majority of the head, as you can tell. But then the eyes, which is painted to be 0.5 value gray, um, that has a scale of 0.5, so we see scattering there, and then we see a lot of scattering around the ears, which of course doesn't look realistic at all. So we need to dial in that value uh, and mix it with a shift A color RGB, uh, I'm sorry, mix RGB node. And let's, um, for the top uh, color swatch, I'm going to copy the scale value that I was happy with, 0 0.03. Hover over it, hit Control C, and then click on the color swatch. And for the value, let's paste that in there. And then for the operation, let's choose Add, because it, once I add the color from our um, SSS scale texture, it will, uh, any areas that are black will add nothing to this value. So the majority of the head will stay at point, um, 0 0.03. And then anything above zero will simply be added, increasing the scale, allowing more light to scatter through it, uh, like the ears, which is what we want. So let's plug in the color to um, color swatch number two, and then plug the color into the scale value giving us continued subsurface effect all over the mesh, but it's much more concentrated in the ears and the eyes. So here's where we have the option to adjust the factor and dial in how much of that scattering that we want. So let's go way down, let's go to 0.1. And that's still too much, how about 0.02? There we go, you know, that's a little bit better. Um, certainly easy to dial in if we want more scattering in the ears, which is, you know, something common that uh, people like to do. Let's see here. I wonder how we're looking with our other um, lighting scenarios. Let's disable render A and take a look at render B. Yeah, that looks pretty good from that angle. How about um, C, which is basically just a backlight. It's still looking good, still looking subsurface scattery. Uh, so that's you know, great. I'll stick with um, render B for a little while. I think that's my favorite uh, lighting setup. And jump back over to the node editor because the only component that's missing from my uh, simplistic subsurface uh, skin material is the specular component. So if we add a shader um, glossy BSDF and then mix it, let's see, shader, mix shader node, mix it with our subsurface we'll start to get some reflections, which are certainly a necessary part of a skin shader. And um, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but with reflections comes Fresnel. So let's create that component now. 
Shift A input uh, layer weight. Shift A vector, let's see, not vector, I'm sorry, converter color ramp. Plug in our facing value into the factor of our color ramp. And just to, let's see, dial this in, let's plug it into an emission node first before using it to control the factor of our mix shader node. There we go. Let's switch our interpolation to B spline and drag our lower um, dark flag up. Yeah, to be like that. And now plug this into um, the color output into the factor value of our mix shader. Plug that back into the surface so we can see our specular component now. I think that's looking a whole lot better. But um, I would like to take this one step further and also use this color ramp to control the roughness value of our glossy BSDF so that um, as our geometry faces away from the camera, which is increasing the amount of the glossy BSDF, which is why we get this nice rim light, I also want it to um, decrease the roughness value, making it uh, more shiny. So let's add a color mix node and let's make the top uh, color swatch the value of the surface that's facing more directly at the camera. Let's change that to point um, three. And then uh, for color swatch number two, let's change that to be uh, much lower, to be more shiny. And let's try 0.01 for that. Then the color of our color ramp goes into the factor and this color goes into the roughness. And uh, then let's do a test with and without it. First, without. And, um, oh, okay, I messed up. I messed up something. Let's go back. I also need another mix node like this one to control the factor a little bit more because uh, right now it's black, you know, for the faces that are, uh, for the surface that's facing the camera more directly. So there's no reflection happening, which is clearly not um, accurate. So we'll plug that color ramp into the factor of another mix node and the top value needs to be, let's say 0.1 and then the bottom value needs to be point, hmm, let's go 0.5. That might be a little bit strong in both areas. Let's go uh, 0.3 in the bottom and 0.05 in the top. Yeah, let's give that a shot. There we go, that's much better with the um, glossy clearly showing up on the uh, front of the forehead, front of the nose, and also the lips. That's certainly helping our skin out. Uh, that's without the roughness mapped. Now let's jump to slot six and plug in our mix node uh, for our roughness value and render again. And here we have a much uh, more subtle glossy effect but this is how we can control um, how sweaty our character is. So if we go to slot seven, you know, he looks a little bit shinier, a little bit more sweaty. Slot six, you know, not so much. Um, so we can tweak those values. I think I, I would tweak the values for, um, let's see, the upper slot to be, let's see, 0.25 instead of three. And then maybe increase the factor, how much, um, how much gloss is being added Right now, the value is uh, 0.05. I would increase that. Let's see, I'll actually increase that to 0.1, double it, and then leave the roughness as is at 0.3. And then perhaps bring in a little bit more reflection on the sides of the head with this bottom value over here from 0.3. Let's go to 0.4. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Do one more render, uh, jumping back to the UV image editor. Um, let's put this in slot five. Yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, switching back to slot six, then slot five, more reflections um, or higher gloss value on top of the subsurface, I think works good. What we want is a, a nice balance when it comes to skin, where with subsurface, the details will be washed out basically. That's how it should be. And the way we get them back is with, you know, specular reflections. It really gives you a sense of the depth that the light is penetrating.
So um, that's definitely a key part is striking the balance between specular and subsurface. But um, yeah, that's, you know, essentially all of my components for this simplistic subsurface shader using the um, subsurface node. And if we go back to the node editor, um, you know, I have all kinds of places to plug another map in. For example, uh, let's add a bump map, shift control D, my image texture. Go grab that uh, texture map, SSS bump right here. And to test this out, let's unplug our color from the subsurface scattering node and leave it, oh, whoops, that was the scale. Let's unplug the uh, color texture so that it's white. And at this point, I need to do render previews at a higher resolution to see more detail. So I'm gonna bump that up from 50% of the render res to 100% and also increase my samples. Well, no, I won't do that quite yet. I still want, you know, uh, optimized renders for the previews. And um, anyway, so the bump map is going to be plugged directly into our displacement output of our material. And um, how about we make a little bit more room over here? Right away, I know that my bump is going to be way too strong, or at least usually it is. So let's try doing a render as is and see if we need to dial the bump down at all. Okay, it might be kind of hard to tell because it's still a fairly grainy render. That's another thing about subsurface. It needs more samples to clean up. And uh, since my bump map is a basically poor detail, you can't tell the difference between pores and noise. So um, I also didn't render a, com a before comparison. So let me do that real quick before we start to dial in the uh, bump map. Jump to slot five and um, disconnect the bump image texture. There we go. Here is before, four is after. So um, there's quite a large change and it's almost like the face sort of mushes and melts a little bit once the bump is applied and that's because the bump is way too strong. So let's jump back to our node editor and add a, a converter math node where we can plug our bump texture into. Here is where we can change our operation to multiply and change the um, uh, multiplied value down here to make it point one of the original intensity of the map. Now let's plug that into our displacement output and try rendering again. Here we are with a uh, bump map added. Let's see if we can even tell a difference. We can certainly see a shift, but um, you know, can't really distinguish the extra detail due to the noise. But um, you know, this will be really good when I uh, render my final um, high sample, high resolution image. But uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm really just showing you how I go about uh, dialing in these values. And now that I have the bump dialed in, I can reconnect my uh, color texture to the subsurface scattering node. And then lastly, if I want to be thorough, I can uh, duplicate my image texture node again, shift control D. And this will become my specular map. Uh, keep in mind all of these maps I showed you how to create in the realistic head series. So uh, if you went through that, you should already have a detailed head model with detailed textures like this to accompany it that you can just plug directly into cycles to get that updated uh, subsurfacey goodness like we're doing here. I don't want you to think I'm just breezing through these textures and happen to have all of them. You know, it's a fairly involved process that you can see in the Realistic Head series. But anyway, um, the last map I'll show you is the spec map. And if we plug this into um, an emission node to see exactly what we're dealing with, You can see that it's based on the color map with, uh, that's been converted to a black and white value map. And uh, we have some highlighted areas of white around the eyelids to um, give us more of a, a wet eyelid kind of look. Also in the um, lips, we want those to be a little bit more reflective due to their wetness. But then in general, we just have a breakup of the skin uh, specularity. So we're going to plug this into a, let's see, color mix RGB node and uh, use the image as the factor. And then from there, we will choose colors that we want to be our low value and our high value. 
for this top color swatch, which will be um, the lowest value of specularity. Let's make that um, 0.3 and then take it towards the blue direction a little bit, about like that. Because uh, when it comes to human skin, it helps to take the specular reflections into the blue spectrum just a little bit. Um, let's uh, copy that color swatch now with hovering over it and hitting control C, then pasting it with control V over the next color swatch. And let's take that value from 0.3 all the way up to one. And now we have that variation uh, in the specular map, but we have a little bit more control over it. And we don't want the lower value to be zero. We still want it to reflect a little bit, but um, I tend to make my, my controlling maps be black and white because that's easier for me to understand as I make the maps. And also I see how easy it is to plug it into a mix node and dial in specific values after the fact, like here in the shading network. But anyway, now that I have that set up, let's plug that into our glossy color. And uh, that should help to break up our glossy component of the skin uh, very realistically because um, uh, before this, it was very uniform across the entire um, head and breaking that up certainly will help with realism. So at this point, I think I'm happy with my shader based on the preview down here. And I will, um, let's increase my samples for a final render from 500 to 1000 and hopefully be done with this simplistic um, skin shader. And at about six and a half minutes, which really isn't too bad um, considering, you know, we're at a fairly high resolution and certainly a lot of samples, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty good uh, representation of skin, I think, but like everything, it could of course use some more tweaking. But uh, at this point, I'm fairly satisfied and I would begin to do test renders in different lighting conditions. One thing that I notice can affect a skin material um, more than you might expect is the environment light. So let's switch to slot number three and um, enable my world environment texture, which is currently at a strength of zero. So it's basically turned off. What if we switch that to number one and it's uh, clearly way too strong. So let's go to 0 0.5. And uh, this represents more of a daytime uh, rendering scenario. And uh, while this looks pretty good, um, typically environment lights, once they are introduced, you know, I'll have to go back and readdress my subsurface settings because it needs to look good in both lighting conditions. But uh, I suppose at this point, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the simplistic version of the uh, skin shader. Um, and I know I'm calling it simplistic, but if we take a look at the node editor, some might not call this simplistic because we have a lot of nodes in here, but that's mainly due to the textures that I'm using. Um, because as far as subsurface goes, it's just one node. Um, one layer, if you will. Um, it's very common when it comes to skin shaders to have a tri-layer system, which I went over with Blender Internal in the Realistic Head series. And if you come from Mental Ray or V-Ray or other high-end render engines, um, you'll be familiar with the tri-layer system. That's where it can get really complex. And uh, in Blender, again, Matthew Heimlich has uh, ported Arnold's complex shader um, into Blender as a node group, and that's what I'm going to show you next. But um, if you feel satisfied with the result that I'm kind of showing you and feel satisfied with the range of options that you have to tweak just the subsurface scattering node by itself, then this is uh, you know a good option for you. It's what I tend to do, um, namely because I'm satisfied with the result and this next method, the complex um, Arnold port shader, takes almost twice the amount of time to render and clean up. But um, it does give you all those options that you're used to if you come from one of those commercial render engines. So that is what the next lesson is about.